So welcome to ANZ Facebook Live. I'm Naomi Simpson and tonight I'm talking to Felicity Rogers, the founder of Cargo Crew. So welcome, Felicity. Thanks, Naomi. It's great to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you. <laughs> but before we get stuck into the questions, let's roll to a video and see a little bit more about your business. Hi, I'm Felicity Rogers, the founder and creative director of Cargo Crew. Cargo Crew is the modern uniform. We design and produce uniforms that staff love to wear. Come inside and take a look. We launched Cargo Crew as a brand in 2012 with just four denim aprons. Today, our range has grown to be over 100 styles. We're dressing businesses from the small cafe around the corner to large international brands. We warehouse our range here in our Brunswick East headquarters and we also offer in-house embroidery. We believe uniforms are an extension of any business's brand identity and we're here to support that. So this evening we're going to be talking about scaling a business. So how do you take it from startup to being something quite material and significant? And that's what you've been doing for the last 15 years. So I do want everybody to submit their questions into the comments section below, and we'll be asking them live on air. But thank you for to, to the few people who sent in some prior to us getting started so we could have a little practice. But here Sounds we go good. to Tiara. Tiara's got a question. If you were to start a small business from scratch, what with a small budget, so small business, small sure, budget, sure. after just graduating for university or TAFE, how would you deal with major growth within a small period of time? So quite a few complex questions there, Naomi. Um, I'll focus firstly, I guess, on starting a, a small business with not much cash. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously obviously a common, a common challenge that many small businesses and start-offs have. Um, so I guess in that regard, it's all about using the resources that you have around you and um, getting some very creative thinking happening. How can you get your business or brand that you're producing, how can you get that out there in a cost-effective way? So being super savvy with, um, with the money that you do have and how are you spending that to promote the product or invest in product development. So it sounds like Tiara, though, has the, pro the opposite problem. Mm -hmm. She's got plenty of customers. Yep. She's straight out of university. Yep. She doesn't know exactly what she's doing. Yep. And she wants it to go from zero to hero pretty quickly. Yep. So what would you suggest she does? A major account. Um, I guess she would definitely have to look at her finances. Can she afford to finance this, um, you know, this job or this opportunity? Um, you obviously don't want to step into something that you can't manage from a financial perspective and not be able to, to deliver to the customer. Mm. So I would say definitely she needs to be looking at what finance does she have available to her? Um, can she speak to the customer or can she speak to the market and can she get some cash flow up front, e.g. Um, if it's a corporate order, can there be a deposit payment? This would definitely help her with her cash flow and issues. That's one thing that you did, did you? Absolutely. I would say that that is actually how we were able to build our business in the early days, was very much catering to that corporate market. We, um, we did a lot of bespoke work when we first started. And, um, and luckily, we had an amazing stable of corporate clients who we were able to request deposit payments from. And that helped fund the jobs, which is, you know, which is a huge challenge when you're starting a business. It really is. You know, Tiara, one of the things that I would say is to make sure that no matter what you say to a customer, you absolutely fulfill on. Because you really only get one chance to build a brand reputation. Mm -hmm. There's a Shark Tank company actually out of the US and I really like their product, but clearly they were having troubles on delivering to their customers. So they managed the expectation and said it'll be 12 weeks before you get your product, but please trust us and deposit your money here. I have to say, I haven't got the product yet. I'm still a believer and I've kept the URL just in case I need to follow up. But if they don't fulfill on the work, I'll be straight after them. So do make sure, I think it's a great suggestion from Felicity, wherever possible, get your customers, especially in early days, mm. to prove the product and to grow your business. So, But be really transparent and straight with them. But come on, let's move to Simon's question. Simon's got a great question. How can a service-orientated trade business grow with demand 
when they've got limited, capable, which is an interesting word, capable staff available. So it sounds like building the team mm. in a service business. How would you it's go about building a service, a service orientated team? Well, I think um, with any business, there's obviously competition around um, getting the right people on board. You know, how can you attract those people to come and work for you? Um, so I think for, um, for Simon, if he is in a service business such as a trade business, um, how can he like make his business stand out from his competitors as far as attracting you know the capable staff you know it should come back to I guess the values that he's trying to build within in his business and how can he promote those to um, to attract people to want to work for him um, again I think that these days with social media you can really talk to your um, you know to the community you can talk to people who are potentially going to come and work for you and you can really promote what you can offer people um, you know in joining your business so, so if you did at Cargo Crew? Well, we're very what much about... What did you do to build the team? To build the team, um, that's been a quite, in some ways, an organic process initially, which was obviously a huge step when you do start employing people. Um, and then we did have a very, um, a stage of rapid growth. So we did have within, you know, a couple of years going from a team of five to 20. That's a, you know, that's a big, a big change in the, in the number of people in the business. So for us, I think that was one of the biggest challenges because you have to become, I think, an expert in so many areas all of a sudden. You can be an expert in the design and the product development um, and how you market and sell your, your product. But um, then also managing a team and how you develop that team is really important. And this is also probably something for Simon to take on board, thinking about if you are wanting to attract the right people, how are you going to retain them and how are you going to progress them through the business, giving them opportunities. So for us, we were very um, fortunate. We were introduced to a business, business consultant um, many years ago who we have um, who's been with us on the journey of growth and um, and she's helped us you know understand and implement frameworks so that we can show the team as we build you know what does the job look like today what's it going to look like tomorrow so it shows people a path of how they can continue to develop um, within your organization and it also I think um, it, it, it gets people on board and you know basically supporting and working hard for what the business is trying to achieve as one common vision. You know, Simon, um, Felicity's got some really great advice there. A lot of it, in fact, it's, it, we could, I think we could write a book about this. Uh, in fact, why don't we give you a copy of Ready to Soar, Simon? Because there is a whole chapter there about engaging people around you with your vision and how you go about that. So I think Ready to Soar would be a fabulous idea for you. Look, um, I, I did something similar, which is I did get professional help. I made sure that I had experts because in the very early days, what I was doing was, oh, does anybody have a friend? Mm. When actually that doesn't yeah. really work. Friends, Long families, yep. and, uh, 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 anyway, they, they out. sometimes <laughs> become foes, so that's not good. So um, really, but then also having a framework. So how you bring people into the organisation, the commitment and promise that you make for people, but I think your word capable is very interesting because I, I remember a friend of mine who kept saying he couldn't find any great salespeople mm. until he realised the consistent denominator the cons between all of those recruits was himself. And what he had to do was shift how he was going about the recruitment and onboarding process. Correct. Our job as leaders in our business is to challenge people to greatness, to nurture them, but also to recognise them for their contribution. Mm -hmm. And I know that you know that I'm passionate about this because mm. of ready.com. But let's move to Lauren's question. Mm. So Lauren, if you're investing in a dedicated salesperson to grow leads, is there such a thing as a reasonable time frame in which they need to deliver results? Now, Sales is an interesting thing because we don't know the business that you're in, whether it's an enterprise or corporate sale mm -hmm. or whether it's consumer sales. But I can imagine if you've got a storefront and you've got people coming in, you'll be wanting them to make sales immediately, but there might be a whole lot of nurture marketing. So let's, let's assume that you're actually talking about corporate sales. So Felicity, in your experience, mm -hmm. given the business that you've been in, which mm -hmm. is, is about corporate sales, yep. how do you Initially. know whether somebody is going to be successful in selling? Um, that's a really interesting question because we have built our business very much um, organically through our product, promoting our product um, through our marketing channels and very much through building relationships initially before going online where you all of a sudden have 10,000 customers. Um, however, so in that regard, we, we didn't recruit a sales role 
upfront. And we've, we actually built the sales and the relationships ourselves. So between myself and my sister, early days when it was just us two in the business, um, you know, we really developed those relationships and nurtured those relationships. And L'Oreal was, um, was one of my first customers 15 years ago, and they're still a customer today. So those, those relationships are really real. Um, so I can't give an example exactly of employing a salesperson and saying, right, this is our expectation, um, because we've managed to sell, you know, to grow our sales very much through online the last five years. But yeah, our experience has very much been around, you need to give people time, I think, to develop real genuine relationships. You know, what are they selling to the customer? How, is, how are they different to who else is out there? And the way that they kind of build that rapport with the customer, then, you know, that sometimes takes a little bit, bit of time, but it builds that trust. And it really does lead, I believe, to more like genuine long-term relationships between the supplier and the customer. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think there's nobody who can sell like the founder. And um, one of the things that I found was that I just literally couldn't, uh, there, I didn't have enough yeah. hours in the day. Yeah. So what I did was actually backfill my time with yeah. really great administrative sales support yeah. mm -hmm. so that they were then account managing. Yeah. So I go and win the work and then yeah. they'd account manage yeah. and that really, really worked for me. And that's the same for us. Yeah. And the other thing is by osmosis, when I'm hanging out with the salespeople all the time in yeah. the car, they're yeah. getting my DNA yeah. and they begin to speak yes. the same way. Yes. So the more time I spent with the salespeople. Yes. So what I never did was say, look, there's He's this, a salesperson. off you go, no. set and forget, get on the no. phone and call. I felt that it, as, if I could really nurture them, yeah. whether that can start a scale on a, on a global, but we, you know, we do pretty big corporate sales yeah. and that, yeah. was, that was very much about Because you don't, want them, you don't want that salesperson to potentially behave in a way that doesn't fit the values, going back to the values again. And yeah. is it, you know, it isn't just for us about a sales role, it's relationships. And to your point, how are you servicing those customers? Yeah. Once you land the customers, what is in place to service them? You know what used to be really funny though, is I'd go out to meet someone. So I remember like when I went to visit Optus a very long time ago and they were a massive corporate sale. Yeah. And I just kept nodding and saying, yes, of course. Yes, yes. of course we'll open an office in New Zealand. Yes, yes, of course. And then I come back to the office and Gemma's going, what have you promised them? And of course I'm the founder. So then we have to do anything, it. Anything, anything. So, you can do anything. You know, growth. Anyway, great question, Lauren. I think you absolutely deserve a copy of Ready to Soar. Make sure, Lauren and Simon, that you, um, in the inbox to ANZ directly, your addresses. Otherwise, we don't know where to send them. So, Lauren and Simon, can you please inbox? But let's move to Aaron's question. What? What? What were some of the challenges going for in a business of two people to 20? What time frame did you do that? You've been in business um, for that, 15 years. Yeah, so going from um, two to 20, well, I can say going from probably five to 20 would have been within a three year, you know, three, three year period. So, um, and you know, the challenges, like I mentioned before, is it's not just about um, finding great people, which we do have an amazing team, um, but it's also how you integrate them in with the induction process, having things in place that, um, yeah, to, to bring them into the business and make sure that you're setting them up to succeed. So um, like I said before, you know, having people, ad you know, advice from around um, people that have experience in that area is absolutely key. Um, I think the other challenges in, in growing a team, um, you know, from, from small to, to larger, obviously there's more financial commitments. So how are you, um, what seat are you putting that, that person into and what's that delivering back to the business? You know, the last thing that you want to do is over invest in resources that's not, you know, adding to the bottom line. So um, that's challenging, you know, making sure that the people that you're hiring, that you can see that there's potential in them to keep moving the business forward and to, um, yeah, manage that from a financial perspective. Yeah, we, we are always looking at the commercial return. Um, one of the things that I did in identifying the role was what do people love mm. and what do people loathe? Mm -hmm. And if we could play to people's strengths, mm -hmm. and often it might be a technology or an innovation that could take away the, or we could automate something. Yep. So that was, what, that was one thing. But rhythm set me free, like rhythm. So what I found is if people knew where they were to be, what was going on and there was just this rhythm. So literally we would have every meeting there would be, every Monday there would be a leadership meeting which mm -hmm. would cascade to then the next level of leadership. Yep. They would have team meetings and then they, every single person in the business would have a one-on-one. -on -one. Yep. There would always be a, um, 
a company wide, yep. you know, they call them all hands in yep. America, but yep. ev everybody getting yep. together and we Tool go box. through and then we celebrate people's successes. So yep. I found that rhythm, especially yep. meeting and communications yep. rhythm. In fact, I'm so passionate about this, Aaron. I have written a blog just for you, it'll go live tomorrow, because it was one of the things that was so critical to scaling a business with the rhythm of how we got meetings going. I'm going um, to read that. I know, it's really good. <laughs> I think, There's yeah. a lot of trial and error in there, and it's yeah. also about how you set agendas. You don't necessarily have to have a meeting to go for a yeah. whole hour. No, you can have it's one a waste for 12 of time. Minutes. In fact, and how we work in the huddle. So, Erin, uh, um, that blog post will go live at naomisimpson.com um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, in fact, Everybody, Aaron, I'm going to give you a copy of Ready to Soar because we're just so generous tonight. But we're also like so generous tonight. So my team at NaomiSimpson.com have decided to give every single person who watches Facebook Live tonight wow. the first cop, the first chapter of Ready to Soar. But you have to go to join.naomiSimpson.com to get it to hear all about how Amazing. we scale those businesses. But it's time to go and have a look at the fabulous uniforms. You know, Why not? They're, they're, they're here looking so tell, fabulous. Do tell me about some of the clients. Who would these be uniforms for? Um, so essentially when we launched Cargo Crew as a brand, so what we did is we, um, as I talked about earlier, for many years when, when I first started the business um, and when my sister joined me, we were very much focused on the corporate market. So everything was made to order um, from a brief. And I guess going through many years of, of you know, producing custom uniform programs, dressing the latest venue that was opening in, in Melbourne, we got an understanding of what people really wanted. And the reality is doing custom uniforms is an extremely time consuming and expensive process. You have to wait um, you know, to reorder, it's expensive, there's minimums. So in 2012, or well, prior to that, um, we realised that we need to develop our own uniform brand that we can offer from stock that people can buy directly from us and, um, and that we can sell at a reasonable price. Um, and so this is what you can see here. These are some pieces from our range. So when we first launched Cargo Crew, it was very much targeted towards the hospitality industry. So you can see here our aprons. The Henry apron here is one of our most famous aprons. Is that the one that <laughs> I was given? Um, that's its sister, you would say. Oh, they're they're sisters sister. or brothers, yeah. Oh. So they are, they're related, very similar. Um, and, and basically we have our striped t-shirts and our, um, our denim shirt and our chino pants. So I guess moving from hospitality into, re into the retail market. Um, there's a lot of businesses, you know, in the retail area where we dress with the denim shirts and the chino pants. And we like to call it the modern uniform. So it's, um, it's a modern take on, on uniforms. Uh, it's, it's really fabulous. Now, this makes sense also in terms yeah. of your ability to scale. Yes. So rather than doing bespoke one-offs, you looked at what was a broad offering yes. so that you could Step, repeat, step, repeat, step, Correct. repeat, and ultimately make more money that way. Well, it's, it was definitely about, I guess, widening the funnel of who we were selling to. So, yeah. you know, before we launched the brand and before we went online, for example, it was very much relationship driven and um, working for a, a select stable of clients. When we launched Cargo Crew um, in 2012 online, it, it automatically became a national business. And then what's followed from that is an international business. So, um, you know, we're on track at the moment, um, we're shipping to around 40 countries. Um, and the international market makes up around 15% of our total online revenue. So, and that's just growing. That's without us even actually advertising anywhere overseas at present without having a distributor. We're literally just growing organically from the product that we're offering and, and it appeals. It's appealing um, it's to many a, countries. Yeah. Such a wonderful story. It's pretty story, exciting. Felicity. Yeah. Really congratulations. Thank you. Really congratulations. Thank Getting you. that online piece. Yeah. And it does actually show that you can run a business from anywhere. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the gorgeous things about Australia is that we can run global businesses from any rural community, regional For community, sure. yep. and all of a sudden we can take our offering anywhere. So yep. the thing that limits us most is yep. we think we can't. Yep. And I have found that surrounding ourselves with like-minded people, absolutely. we can learn from others. If, you know, yep. if she can do it, I can yeah, do it. Yeah, absolutely. Know, so Remy's got a question. How have you found a balance between being creative and running your business? Are you creative? Oh, absolutely. What was your background before 
Um, well, I studied um, fashion at RMIT um, yeah. and then pretty much straight from university, a girlfriend and I set up a label mm. um, and we did that for five years. So during that time, we were one of the first to do the Melbourne Fashion Festival, the Young Designer Parade. We used to wholesale around the country and everyone would say, oh my God, you guys are doing amazing. Mm. Um, but the reality was we couldn't afford to buy a coffee oh. um, because we never got paid. And I always make jokes that we had an amazing business and someone said to me, well, that wasn't an amazing business if you couldn't afford to buy a coffee. And I said, no, but it was because we had that opportunity to be really creative. It was like a passion project. We got involved in the fashion weeks and the fashion festivals. And, you know, we had five years of really just like being free and doing what we wanted to do. And it was during that time we used to get approached by businesses who would come to us and say, can you guys do us a good looking uniform that people want to wear? Mm. And that's our tagline these days where we say, we create uniforms that staff love to wear. Um, so that was my background. So following on from the label, I decided to go out just solely on my own. And my girlfriend um, at the time, she went into um, design sportswear. And, um, and that was when I decided to get into the, you know, designing fashionable uniforms because I think I've got a natural love for marketing mm. as well. And um, so I think the combination of fashion and marketing, and I could see, I guess, the, the benefit that good looking uniforms would bring to a brand or an event, bringing that together was something I was really passionate about. So it was a natural extension for me to focus on uniforms. And, um, but yeah, balancing the creativity and the business side, I would have to say that is definitely a lot easier when you have a smaller business. In fact, you really need to be creative because, um, you know, at the time it was about obviously me designing the product and um, producing it locally at the time, um, but also about using, yeah, all of our creative thoughts to and our creative skills to market, market our product. I think as the business begins to grow, there's definitely more pressure to be focusing more on the business. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's very important that if you want to scale a business, you need to make that time and you need to you know, have that headspace to step away and actually focus on the things that might be more challenging. You know, I'm, I might not necessarily enjoy as much um, the business side when, it, um, you know, when I have to really focus on oh, those things. Oh, it strikes me you do like doing a deal. <laughs> but Are I definitely, I do love it, but I do find it, I find more challenging in many ways um, and so I think yeah it's just about giving yourself that headspace to really think clearly and to focus on it. Yeah Remy one of the things that I look at in balancing where I spend my energy is often about what is the best use of my time so bookkeeping or logistics is not necessarily the right use of my time I need yep. to stay across the numbers I need to be connected to them the best use of my time is staying connected to customers and listening mm. to customers and our suppliers yep. who are, you know, our business partners really. So great question, Remy. We're going to keep going a bit faster. So Val, if Val's asked us the question, if you could do it all again, what would be the first external role you'd hire? A project manager, logistics, marketing, who would you hire? What was the first hire? Um, well, the first hire was, I guess you would say, um, it was when it was my sister and I on our own, it was an account coordinator to help service those customers like we talked about before. Um, but when I say, you know, what would I do or would I change anything, I, I probably wouldn't because in many ways we had the ideal situation where we were capable and able to produce the product, we were able to market it and we were able to sell it. So having those things covered to grow a business, if, if the picture was to, I want to grow this business, then I think really for us the, the perfect next step was um, when my husband Paul came on board and managed operations. So Being for me... Being able on what your customers promised. Correct. Yeah. And, and how can that be more efficient? You know, the way that we did things before he came on board were very manual. Mm -hmm. um, so looking for efficiencies and what systems we had to implement to so, make that work. So good question, Val. Val, my first employee was the head of security. I think it's very important that everyone has security in their business. That would be Dexter the dog. <laughs> I didn't actually have to pay him very much, which was really quite <laughs> fine. But come on, Val, let's send you a copy of Ready to Soar. Do uh, inbox ANZ because there's lots of suggestions about, because it depends on the sort of business, really, who's the right person for you. So have a little look in there. So, Rebecca, what marketing program has the best return on investment to drive online sales? Wow. Marketing program. Marketing program. I'm a big believer in do, analyse, do. It's, you know, there's no set and forget when it comes to marketing mm -hmm. or promotion. Mm -hmm. You know, one day something works, the next day mm -hmm. it stopped working. Mm -hmm. Social mm -hmm. media, as we found out from the last Facebook Live, mm -hmm. changed their algorithms all the time. Yep. So maybe pick one campaign that you would like to talk about as a, as a, as a case study. 
Um, so, yeah, I guess for us, like, you know, managing and looking for what's working is definitely in the online space is obviously, um, you know, looking at our SEO and um, analytics. Search engine optimization. Yes. And analytics accounts. So, you know, where we're spending any money on AdWords, how are they, um, how are they performing? Um, and, you know, so we're talking here about the paid advertising as opposed to the marketing, which in our experience has actually given us a lot more organic growth than the paid paid advertising because I really believe that so many people they don't you know they don't want to see the paid ads on Google they want to find the right product for them and obviously Google does manage how all of that kind of thing you know when people are searching what they get shown so um, as far as a program I would definitely be of course investing in SEO and analytics but I would also be investing the time in creating the content that you're going to get found so you focus on those keywords you build amazing content that's going to be relevant to your audience and people that organ that grows you know people spending time on the page reading what you've got to say looking at some beautiful photos the more that they do that the more your organic you know search is going to grow so that for me has been you know the combination of that that's really worked for us mm -hmm. you know um, thanks I I agree with you, but I think the hardest part is how do you stand out? Seth, uh, Seth um, wrote a book, um, you know, Purple Cow, a long time ago, and actually still is very re relevant. Mm -hmm. what, are, what do you want to be world famous for, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Always have in mind, what do I want to get from this marketing campaign? Sometimes it's just to build awareness. You just want people to know about you. Mm -hmm. What I've found in the 16 years that I've been in business is that customers are more and more fickle. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's really, really hard to grab somebody's attention. Mm -hmm. So the best way to get a customer is to have other customers introduce them. Mm -hmm. So a customer get customer campaign has been one of the most successful things I've done. But be really clear about what it is that you're trying to achieve. And I've also always found that if we're slightly entertaining and a little bit interesting, maybe people will want to come back. So Rebecca, give that a crack. Okay, we're going to keep winding this up and keep, uh, we've got to keep our answers short, otherwise we miss out on okay, all the questions, okay. okay? So Richard, did funding play a part? Richard's asked the question, did funding play a part in scaling your business? Mm -hmm. Was there any, if so, what type, debt, equity? If no, um, then what was, what was your funding model based around? Um, so I guess now it's definitely about smart cash flow. Like we've definitely over the years reinvested, reinvested to really manage our growth and to have the funding there as we've grown. Um, but it really depends on, I almost feel like as a small business, it depends on what life stage you're at when you start your business. Like for me, when I started the business, you know, um, initially, um, it was, I was in my 20s, so I, I didn't have a lot behind me. So as I mentioned before, I did use, um, in a lot of ways, our clients to help me fund those initial um, jobs in the early days. So that was, yeah, by asking for payment terms that were, you know, deposits up front, and then reinvesting that money back into the business was, you know, a habit that obviously we got into early days, and also having learnt from having the label, where at such a young age, with, you know, no money in the bank, constantly chasing money. Money, having that financial pressure, I never wanted to be in that situation again. Oh, yeah. um, so I learned very early days to manage that cash flow. So for us personally, it has been, you know, smart cash flow management. And also, of course, thinking about, you know, the rainy days, of course, you need to have something else in place if something, you know, happened that you weren't expecting. So we do, you know, obviously have an overdraft in place with ANZ and that's there, you know, should we need it. I think that's really important. Um, but for us, definitely reinvesting profits has been the key to how we've scaled. That's great. Yeah. Look, um, it's a, funding is a really big question and it depends on your business model and what you're really trying to do. But understanding how cash flows and, and where it gets stopped, it's kind of like water. That's how I think. Sometimes you need to dam it up, you need to save it, and other times you need to irrigate. But Richard, such a good question. You do need a copy of Ready to Source and make sure you send the, your address to the inbox of ANZ because there is a whole whole section here on funding, grants, cash flow, and all sorts of things about business models. So Amanda's asked the question, how important is building a great strong culture when scaling up without losing your values? Well, I would say that, yeah, absolutely, culture is 100%, but they should align. You know, you should be building a culture that aligns with your values. And I think these days, 
people are looking for to be part of businesses that mean something, that are doing something interesting that they can contribute to. So if you can really focus on building that culture, people will give you that, you know, they're all. And I think that's, as a small business, that's what you need. You don't want people to be sitting there just doing their job. You know, you really want to encourage people to step outside of their comfort zones, you know, um, how can they keep developing? And then that's only going to help contribute to the business. So building that that culture, I would say, is absolutely so vital to, so to scale to Buy scale a business. Bus. Sorry? What's that mean? Buy muesli bars? By, oh, that? I have to laugh. So we won, you know, best yeah. employer five years in a row. And then yeah. this TV crew came in and they yeah. saw that we had muesli bars in the kitchen and they said, yeah. so you've got a great culture because you buy muesli bars. And I was yeah. like, no. I, yeah. No, <laughs> it's about bars. setting the purpose. It's about yeah, aligning the purpose, people to the communicate, values. Communicate, it's communicate, communicate. It's about making sure that we have a framework, that yeah. we're recognising people. And in fact, yeah. I invented a whole business out of it, which is yeah. already.com. Yeah. So it, culture is really important, but it's Get never set same. and forget. No. So it's about purpose, values, Reminders. alignment, and making sure. And reinforcement. Like yeah. reinforcement of that message. But people reinforcement. have to choose to participate. It's no. not about whether you put... Yeah. Moosey bars in the no, kitchen. No. Sorry, I was getting a bit off yeah. tangent. <laughs> I was like, I was just the saying, bars. <laughs> yeah. No, but sometimes people think that. It's like, oh, yeah. that's because you, you know, have beers on a Friday. You've got to, yeah. No, no, that's not what we're There's way culture. more than that, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, and, it's and definitely. And in fact, I've never seen one business to be kind of the same. Yeah. But Common great goal. question. Loved it to bits. So Common Ryan's goal. got a question for us. How did you decide which international markets were best for you mm -hmm. and where to take your brand? Well, for us, um, you know, again, it's been very organic. Like we, um, what we did, we relaunched our website around 12 months ago to a bigger platform. So we'd been on Shopify, which was, you know, our starting platform. And then we upgraded to Magento, which is a much bigger um, e-commerce platform. And, and what came with that was the international shopping that we now, um, that we now offer. So the, we, we didn't target exact countries. It's just been, again, through our organic growth that, that certain countries we're shipping more to. But at the moment, as I said, we're shipping to around 42 different countries um, without having actually physically set up there or you know, partnered with the distributor. So I think that things are changing so much these days that you can, you can almost... You know, so you're saying it chose you, you didn't choose it. Correct. Yeah. And, um, but what's really interesting is at the moment we're participating in um, a program program which is run by George Washington University. MBA students have actually um, been assigned our company to research and to basically, um, as a business case, to suggest to us which international market we should actually focus on and go into head first. And um, they're working on that and they're going to um, come to Australia in May and they're going to present that to us. So we've been having weekly Skype meetings with this team of these MBA students. So amazing to get, you know, their input and their from a different lens, you know, from us sitting here in Australia, this is a group of MBA students in America who come from all different countries themselves. And they've also had very varied work um, experience in their professional lives. And they're spending their time on focusing on how, which country we should focus on what you know what opportunity should we take next so you know, that's pretty exciting a great leveler isn't it yeah I mean, absolutely really 20 years ago they wouldn't have even known you existed absolutely and you would have to have thing. had a distributor or you would have had to have an agent or you would have had to physically go and set up so I'm not saying that, that we won't do that but for the moment it's yeah the international market has has chosen us um, but I think like anything like with the online presence once you get a following in an area Google also tracks that so the more sales that you're getting in a certain country then you see you, you see the pattern you start to get more and more so um, in that way you're you're getting I guess that market just from the organic um, traffic which is you know. Now if we've got time I would like to come back to um, something that you've raised which is how you select technology mm -hmm. because really in building a business you've mm. also got to choose different mm. sorts of uh, technology sure. along the way. But yep. we'll ask Jess's question next. How did you land your first big fish client? Um, well, I love this story because I think, um, you know, going back 15 years, it's such a different time. You know, that was the time when, when we first did land our first big fish client, which was L'Oreal. And, um, and we, we landed that client through an introduction. Um, and it was very much, um, a girlfriend of mine was working at The Age in fashion. So she had some great relationships at L'Oreal. And I remember um, driving out there, having a meeting with a few of the L'Oreal girls. And I just remember clearly thinking they're not that interested. It was like they were having the meeting just because my friend was at The Age and she had some influence. Mm. Um, um, but then a couple of weeks later, um, someone from L'Oreal 
L'Oreal called me and they said, I was past your details, our current suppliers let us down, um, we'd like to brief you on a job. So that was the opportunity, the door was open, but then I had to prove myself and then following that there was many, many more orders to come and I was working on all the brands at L'Oreal. But then if you compare that to just a couple of years ago about a big fish client um, and the difference of how technology has enabled the reach, you know, you no longer need to know somebody. Um, so for us, that was Gwyneth Paltrow wearing our apron and, um, and her agency, she was running a, um, a pop-up in New York and, um, and the group agency bought aprons from us. Um, we had no idea what they were being used for. We saw it on Instagram and we were like, wow, that's our apron, that is crazy. Then I contacted Goop and I said, um, you know, we're a little Australian business, amazing that you guys have been wearing our product. And they said, oh, actually, Gwyneth loved it so much, she would love to use it for the launch of her beauty brand, which is happening in a month. Would you like to provide uni um, aprons for Gwyneth to wear and also the beauty influencers in New York? Well, yes. So those two scenarios within I guess my career of one, it's old school introductions and two, it's technology. You know, you can, anyone can find your product if you're doing something a little bit different and you have the opportunity and the platform to promote that, then that's really exciting. I think also what's really exciting is you never forget what it feels like. Yeah. You know, how excited did you feel when you saw her wearing your, your apron? I mean, it's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I remember getting to know the other sharks on set and I asked this question, I said, tell me that moment of your first customer. And Steve was gorgeous, he kind of lit up and he, was, he talked about how he was driving around uh, South Australia in the second hand beat up station wagon, literally knocking on people's door, asking them if they wanted to see, be on the World Wide Web. And yet, of course he sold his business for $393 million, but he said he never forgot how you feel. Mm. And if we can engender that into our business, that enthusiasm and that excitement, doesn't matter if it's a little customer or a big one, yeah. that sheer joy yeah. I mean, that's what business is. Yeah. And when you have that and they share that with your team, it's yeah. a wonderful, wonderful culture. Yeah, it is but wonderful. I'll never, ever forget my first customer, Damien Chown, <laughs> to order number 14, just in case you're out there. And you know, because I picked up the phone and go, hi, I'm Naomi Simpson. We like to call all of our customers. One. Anyway, Maria, has, she's got a question for us. When you identified your niche, did you have any large players as competitors? And how did that that direct uh, your course of action. You had massive competitors. Absolutely, and it definitely. In fact, how did you find your niche amongst <laughs> in the, in what such is... a big market? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think essentially we definitely disrupted it. You yeah. know, because we 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 came in and we're like, we know exactly what our customers want, but we want to give them the best quality product that we can. But a we want to too. Absolutely. Starly. Yeah, exactly. And we wanted to be able to deliver that to our customers directly without. Um, resellers and distributors. So traditionally, how the uniform, um, how the uniform, you know, category works is that there's some big players who basically sell to resellers and middlemen and distributors. So basically, if you go to a uniform shop, you'll see the same brand of, of uniforms on offer. If you go to the next suburb and go to another uniform mm -hmm. offering. Um, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to give, you know, something fresh to the market, um, and we wanted to sell that directly um, at an affordable price. So we are, I think, you know, you would say extremely competitive in price to our, to our um, competitors. However, we're very design driven. We're all about producing original product that we know people want to wear. Mm. So um, certainly- So you're saying a product strategy kind of whipped the competition? Absolutely. Yeah. And let's just and say they, they noticed very quickly. Did they notice? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, all they have to do is, I'm sure they just say, okay, what are we doing next season? We'll just take a look at Cargo Crew, <laughs> um, which can get extremely frustrating at times. But um, I did hear a, a saying once that I would never suggest imitation as a strategy. You'll always be second, which is very far from first. Yeah. Great advice, Maria. <laughs> I think that's great advice from Felicity. So Aisha, um, has a question, what is the most important thing to keep in mind when starting a business and how do you analyse it? Is, is, is it, is it if your investment is fruitful? Okay. So we've got a startup, how right. are you going to know if the investment in your startup okay. Is going to be is, fruitful and is it going to work? I guess. Yeah. Well, well I guess. successful. I guess. Yeah. You really need to be um, really clear on what you're bringing to the market. You know, is there is there customers there that want this product? It can't just be about you thinking it's fabulous. Like it has to be that there's a demand for your product. And then if there is, and you do it really well and really different to what's out there, then I would say that's guaranteed success. Yeah, I always think 
It, do you know who your customer is? Do you know where they are? What they want. Do you know how much it's going to cost to find them mm -hmm. uh, and, and what their lifetime value is? So mm -hmm. if you kind of think about that, I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. Interesting word fruitful mm. because there's a difference between being purposeful and just a commercial outcome. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really, you know, so when you say fruitful, I wonder if mm. you mean commercial outcome. Mm. But I always have the theory, if you're not making money, you cannot change the world. Yeah. Uh, you cannot employ people, you yeah. cannot pay your suppliers. Yeah. You must be profitable in business yeah. and you must understand where your cash is yeah. and take responsible, responsibility for your financial literacy. It's yeah. really, really important. So Tracy's got a question. How have you protected your design without people making copies? Let uh, me tell you a story about that. Oh, you think about that. It's, for a again, so in the early days, people literally used to plagiarise our website. How did we know they plagiarised? Because they copied the spelling mistakes as well. <laughs> So they just got a legal letter. You know, it was protected under copyright and, 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 and uh, you know, but people do copy all the time. Any good idea, they're going to copy. But what they can't copy is who you are. They can't copy your relationships. They can't copy your values. And they definitely can't do uh, copy your corporate culture. Mm. So we found that if we just really created an ecosystem for ourselves, then they were always going to do what they were going to do. It's pretty funny, though. They copied our spelling mistakes as well. That is so sad. Yeah, very um, sad. And what yeah, I'm, I mean, literally, I exactly have the same thoughts as you because there is times when it gets extremely challenging when you do see that, um, you know, there's the imitations out there. I mean, we had one example of... Um, you know, some people coming in and wanted to buy our range from us and they wanted to, you know, resell it. And we said, that's not our model. We go direct. Um, so we don't, we're not looking for distributors. Um, and so they proceeded to buy a whole lot of samples online and literally launched a business ripping off our business. Um, so that was extremely, you know, distressing. Um, and they've proceeded to continue to follow us along the whole journey. But the fact is they're never going to catch up because they don't have any ideas of their own. So how can you continue to scale and build a successful business if you actually don't know how to do it yourself? If you have to continuously follow somebody, that's, you know, really sad. Um, but I guess from a protection perspective, you know, there's definitely things that you can do um, within the clothing industry. You can register designs um, and protect yourself yourself in that way. Obviously, you really obviously need to look at the bigger picture of IP, you know, how's your trademarks and your domain names and all of that with the registrations around the world now these days. Um, so making sure that all of those things are in place. And then as, as you said, Naomi, it's very much, it's not just about the product. That's fabulous. We all know that, but it's definitely about how you deliver that to the market. And they can't, people can't replica your, the total formula. Yeah. It really, it, it comes from the heart and it is about the people, the team, you know, how it's delivered, the cut, you know, the client service. We're obsessed with client service at Cargo Crew, so um, it's very hard to replica the whole thing. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. I remember once we had a copycat company that was so so similar. They even were delivering them with red balloons. Not that they called their company red balloon, but they called it that. And I really knew that things were going pear shaped when they started a Twitter account for their dog. And we'd done that for Dexter, head of security years ago and I go, oh, they don't they understand. Just, they've got nothing. Like, they've got no nothing, idea. That no was idea. just to have fun. Yeah. Like, we just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and that was our sense of humour. It, yeah. it wasn't a marketing thing. It was just funny. Yeah, yeah. And we go, oh, my goodness. Anyway, <laughs> so let's just have a couple more questions. But Alison has got a question for us. How did you deal with the inconsistency of rules and regulations by federal, state and local governments and find the right balance. Look, this is completely dependent on the industry. Right. So obviously some industries are more regulated than others. We do have compliance. Um, and what I would always say is get good advice. Um, uh, we, the reason why we get good advice is that investment in how you set up your business and making sure you comply mm. can save you a fortune, whether it be with your IP yep. or whether it's just in terms of making sure you fulfil on all of your tax obligations. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely essential to get really great advice. I haven't found it completely complex between the state regulations. It's much easier here than it is in the United States. Mm. Uh, I know that is very complex when it comes to the, the tax because they're different in every every place mm -hmm. that you do business. Mm -hmm. But have you got anything particular about well, that? Well, I think for us more so, our challenges are um, around you know compliance of, say, care instructions. Um, oh. You will notice, say, for example, companies like Zara who have stores all around the world, when you buy something, they have yes. these like... <laughs> it's like a, like a it's ticket like a huge, Exactly. <laughs> Um, and so if you are, I think, you know, really setting up and focusing on um, 
in certain countries, you do need to ensure that those things are covered. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the only thing I think we've found challenging in that way. Yeah. I, I think good professional <coughs> advice based on your, particularly, uh, your particular uh, industry, Alison, is a really great idea. Yeah. So Alan's got a question for us. How did you build collaborations with other brands? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for us, this has definitely been a, a vehicle that we've really helped to grow our business through, you know, association with other fantastic brands. Um, there are two examples that I can give... Um, one being Time Out, the, um, you know, the publication. We have um, collaborated with them and partnered with them for quite a few years. They're very heavily involved in the hospitality industry, so there was a synergy there initially when we connected as businesses. And um, we, what we do is we provide uniforms and sponsorships and, and prizes for people when, they, um, when Time Out hold their award nights for hospitality venues. They'll win a voucher, say, for our um, for cargo crew to come and get some new staff uniforms. And in, you know, in return, we get some amazing exposure within um, Time Out. So we've got very strong relationships there. And second to that, um, we've, we've worked with Jardin, the, the homewares brand, and, and they approached us. And I think they saw, I guess, that Australian design element that we had that synergy between the two brands. And they wanted to sell our aprons in store. And for me personally, like you, I couldn't think of a more beautiful um, Australian brand than Jardin. So of course, we were going to jump at that opportunity. And, um, and, and what that does, I think it gives you a wider audience, you know, so people who are obsessed with homewares and, and lifestyle all of a sudden are looking at the aprons as well. So it kind of moves away from the business um, audience and kind of opens up the more consumer market looking at our products. So those kind of opportunities, I think, yeah, aligning yourself with brands that um, complement each other and working and collaborating, it's all about embracing the, um, the collaboration economy, yeah. I think is Absolutely. what Absolutely. Yeah. I believe that a customer is there to be shared. Yes. And one of the things that I did was make sure... I, I kind of worked out who was already talking to those customers. The other thing is, who could I add value to? Mm. In other words, they might have a particular product if they added mine as well. They've got a bundle, they've got more to sell, or they've got a broader offering. So together, mm. and joining forces actually made us a more powerful voice. Yep. But I always tried to find out who was already talking to my audience, figuring we may as well go together. Yeah. And hold, a customer is there to be Amazing. shared. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so why not? Yeah. So Aisha... Um, what is your creative strategy behind uh, the success of Cargo Crew? Well, what will we see in the next 15 years? Well, there's so much. Okay. <laughs> there's so much which I can't talk about. Um, however, I think, you know, the creative strategy is honestly, it comes from the heart and it really is about just producing a product that, that we love. You know, everyone at work, you know, is involved in some part of what we're delivering to the market. So the, the strategy really is around doing original product, believing in it. How can we do it better? Even if things are going well, how can we improve that? Like, it's really about competing against ourselves in a lot of ways um, and and then yeah being creative with how we're getting it out to the market who we're partnering with um, how we're creating amazing content that people are interested in reading sharing our community you know the people that we're selling to um, showcasing them um, who's doing some amazing things at the moment in food like let's talk about that how are they doing it so the creative strategy is very inclusive and um, and I think you know it's just making sure you're talking to your market in in the way that you know that they understand the things that interest them, um, that's what works for us. Yeah, I also find that listening to our customers Absolutely, works for sure. Them. Aisha, it's a really, really great uh, question. You can hear that we've had great fun tonight. Having Felicity here, her passion, her drive for her business is wonderful. And I'm sure you all have the same level of passion. But as I said, we've got a special treat tonight. We do want to give every single person who's watched tonight a copy of the first chapter of Ready to Soar. So just go to join.naomisimpson.com and you can get your copy. So thanks so much for coming, Felicity. It's been a terrific night. We've covered all sorts of things. We have. From it's gone so quickly. <laughs> I know it's gone really quickly from creativity to productivity. Yep. Um, but ultimately, to scale a business, it's not easy. Yep. Uh, it takes bravery. It takes yep. courage. It takes determination. And it takes continually learning. So thank you so much for joining us on Facebook Live. I'd really like you all to join us again on May the 9th at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. because we're going to talk about people. We've touched on it a bit tonight, but mm -hmm. we're going to be talking to Ben Thompson from Employment Hero, mm -hmm. who's really looking at how people manage 
the financial well-being of their employees. It's a really interesting story and I look forward to sharing it with you right there in May at 8 o'clock on the 9th of May. So join us with Ben Thompson from Employment Hero. He's the CEO. He happens to be somebody I've known for a very long time, so it'll be like old homework. It's like we're going to have a dinner party. You'll be there. We'll be there. Get your questions in nice and early because I know there will be a lot. Thanks for joining you. I'm Naomi Simpson. See you next month. Bye.